Thank you. Good morning. Good morning to those of you who are here in church and those of you who are watching online. Thank you for joining us at our celebration of the second Sunday of Ordinary Time. We now enter into the season of Ordinary Time until the beginning of Lent on March 2nd. This month of ordinary time gives us a brief time of rest between the major seasons of Advent, Christmas, and then Lent and Easter. Today's gospel is the well-known story of Jesus changing water into wine at the, wed at the wedding at Cana in Galilee. It's a metaphor for the abundant and savory life Jesus offers to all of us in our relationship with him. May we all allow Jesus to transform us, to become worthy vessels of the grace-filled wine of his love and goodness. Please remember to silence your cell phones so that we can worship God without distraction. Thank you. The celebrant for this Mass is Father Isaiah Mary, and preacher is Brother Thaddeus. Let us begin our Mass this morning by singing number... 307. The numbers are up on either side of the altar. The RPP 32, that's Responsorial Psalm, page 32.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Dear friends, as we come to celebrate these great mysteries of our faith, let us quiet our hearts and minds and thank God for his many gifts. I confess. I confess. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us all our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Almighty ever-living God, who govern all things both in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the pleading of your people and bestow your peace on our times. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. For Sion's sake, I will not be silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet. 
until her vindication shines forth like the dawn and her victory like the burning torch. Nations shall behold your vindication and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name pronounced by the mouth of the Lord. You shall be a glorious crown in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem held by your God. No more shall people call you forsaken or your land desolate, but you shall be called my delight and your land espoused. For the Lord delights in you and makes your land his spouse. As a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. The word of the Lord. letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit. 
There are different forms of service, but the same Lord. There are different workings, but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. To each individual, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the benefit of some. To each individual, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for some benefit. To one is given, through the Spirit, the expression of wisdom. To another, the expression of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, mighty deeds. To another, prophecy. To another, discernment of spirits. To another, varieties of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit produces all of these, distributing them individually to each person as he wishes. The word of the Lord. be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. There was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told, Jesus told them, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it. And when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, an inferior one. But you have kept the good wine until now. 
Jesus did this at the beginning, as the beginning of his signs at Cana in Galilee, and so revealed his glory. And his disciples began to, de- to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. So if we look throughout the Old Testament, especially within the, within the Psalms and within the Book of Wisdom, wine is a symbol of joy. Wine is a symbol of joy according to the Old Testament. So here we come to Cana, where there are six stone water jars, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. So Jesus effectively made up to, at maximum, 180 gallons of wine. Moreover, when we come to a village wedding like we have at Cana, on average, archaeology would tell us, on average we would have about 200 people at the village. And of course, going to a wedding would be um, a, a social obligation to go to. It's like having a street filled with, uh, filled with Christmas lights and every single house is uh, lighted up for Christmas and you have that one house that hasn't put up the lights yet. It's a social obligation to go to the wedding. So you have 200 people attending this wedding and 180 gallons of wine. In other words, to put it more simply, Jesus bestowed upon every single man, woman, and child that attended that wedding up to 3.4 liters of wine. So overwhelming, not to make us all alcoholics, but so overwhelming is God's joy for each and every single one of us that he would overwhelm us with his joy, overwhelm us with his peace, and overwhelm us with his compassion. This is one of the thousands of many uh, lessons of the wedding in Cana, that that God enjoys us so much that he overflows his joy into our heart of hearts. Now, of course, at the end of today's, uh, today's, after communion, Brother Thaddeus will come up to offer a fuller homily But at this time, I invite us all to rise now so that we can profess our faith. I believe in one God. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, Consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. This kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As the prophet Isaiah told us in our first reading today, our God delights and rejoices in us. Therefore, we confidently come before him with our needs this day. For all God's people, that we might enjoy the abundant life of love, joy, peace, and purpose that God wants us to have by allowing Jesus to continue to transform our lives as he transformed the water into wine. We pray to the Lord. Lord. For a greater recognition of the Spirit's gifts to us so that we might utilize those gifts to encourage one another, to build up the body of Christ, and to serve those who are in need. We pray to the Lord. Lord, 
for the successes of the various marches for life throughout the country during these weeks, and that the sanctity of all life would receive greater respect in our world. We pray to the Lord. Lord. That inspired by the example of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., racism and all forms of prejudice may cease and that each person may be treated with dignity and respect. We pray to the Lord. Lord. That God would reward and protect from harm our first responders, medical workers, caretakers, and essential workers, and for an end to the pandemic. We pray to the Lord. For Marie Emily Kleck for her birthday, whom we remember in a special way at this Mass. We pray to the Lord. For all of the intentions in our Book of Intentions and those we hold in the silence of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Holy God, we thank you for hearing our prayers and for the abundant life you offer us through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. this your sacrifice and mine may be acceptable to God our Almighty Father. Grant us, O Lord, we pray that we may participate worthily in these mysteries. For whenever the memorial of this sacrifice is celebrated, the work of our redemption is accomplished through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For through his Paschal mystery, he accomplished a marvelous deed, by which he has freed us from the yoke of sin and death, summoning us to the glory of being now called a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for your own possession to proclaim everywhere your mighty works. For you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful light. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. created rightly gives you praise for through your son our lord jesus christ by the power and working of the holy spirit you give life to all things and make them holy and you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rise of the sun to its setting a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name therefore lord we humbly implore you by the same spirit graciously make holy these gifts we brought to you for consecration that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In the similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and gave you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mystery of faith. We eat this bread and drink this song. We proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, Lord as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the ablation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ may make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your life, especially the most blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of God, blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and your glorious, glorious martyrs, with our Holy Father Dominic, San Lorenzo, with all our patron saints, and indeed with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. 
May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O oh Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth. With your servant Francis, our Pope, and Jose, our Bishop, Alex, his assistant, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family, whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O oh merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we are bold to say, Our Father, who was in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not in our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. So together we pray, dear friends, our act of spiritual communion. My Jesus. My Jesus. 
I believe that you are present. I believe that you are present. In the most holy sacrament. In the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things. I love you above all things. And I desire to receive you into my soul. I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment. Since I cannot at this moment. Receive you sacramentally. Receive you sacramentally. Come at least spiritually into my heart. Come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there. I embrace you as if you were already there. And unite myself wholly to you. And unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Let us pray. Pour on us, O Lord, the spirit of your love, and in your kindness make those you have nourished be this one heavenly bread, one in mind and heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I invite Brother Thaddeus to the fourth for our preaching. Good morning. Good morning. So, in our gospel reading today, we listen to the story of the wedding feast of Cana, and there is a great deal that one could say about the wedding feast, including the vast quantity of wine flowing about, as Father Isaiah has made known to you already. But I think that to begin to discuss this passage, we need to start by recognizing the significant fact that this is part of the Gospel of St. John. Now, John's Gospel stands apart from the other three Gospels in that it tells stories about Jesus Christ, which the others do not, and generally has a very unique, perhaps intimate is the right word, take on the occurrences of the ministry of our Lord. But perhaps one of the most striking things about John's gospel is just how, how interconnected everything is. Once, one of my scripture professors explained it to me like this. You can view any book in scripture like a tapestry. When you pull on one passage, it is like a thread. It draws other threads up with it, and this has you scouring the text. But John's gospel is a bit different. So often, when you pull at one of the threads in John, you end up not just bringing a few threads with it, but just about the entire tapestry. And so, the thread that I want to look at here today is the short little interaction between the head waiter and the groom at the end of the reading. The head waiter says, everyone serves good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, an inferior one. But you have kept the good wine until now. As Father Isaiah mentioned, there was a great deal of wine flowing, and so this reasoning makes a lot of sense. You want to put your best foot forward, after all. And so, I propose to you that the head waiter is not complimenting the groom at all. His, his, the thrust of what he is saying is instead that the groom is acting imprudently, even selfishly. See, the head waiter is the one responsible for the distribution of things like wine and so on. And so, in his position, he is dumbfounded why the groom would withhold better wine until late in the event when everybody is already deep in their drinks. This is a wedding. One would expect the best foot to be put forward, and so, and I think just to Philoby, the head waiter is upset, because as far as he can tell, his job was thwarted by the groom's lack of planning or unusual storage of this superior wine. Of course, we know something that the head waiter does not know that this wine was not prepared by the groom of this particular wedding at all, but instead by Jesus Christ. And while the head waiter is upset by the situation he has found himself in, he is in fact taking part of a prophetic symbol, a sign for the heavenly wedding feast that Jesus Christ is ushering in. Perhaps a way to better understand this 
sign is in something more overt, found in the other three Gospels. There, you have the parable of the old wineskins, which should not be filled with new wine, lest they burst asunder. The takeaway from that parable, at least in its clearest form, or at least I think it's the clearest form, in the Gospel of St. Luke, seems to be that there is a new covenant, and that while the old covenant is good, the goodness of that old covenant may well prevent the adherence of the Mosaic law from following or even investigating the new covenant offered by Jesus Christ. All of this in this parable of the old wineskin is framed within the context of a wedding feast where Jesus is the bridegroom. The wedding feast of Cana proposes another angle for the same basic message. Like in the parable, the wine which the bridegroom at Cana offers is good, like the old covenant. It's still wine, and it's not like we have reason to doubt its quality. Only, we can say that whatever its quality, it does not hold a candle to the new wine that Jesus Christ offers. It was a stark enough difference, after all, for the head waiter to think it important to take the groom away from the festivities, take him aside, and admonish him, after all. All well and good. But what does this really tell us about the new covenant? So it's better than the old. That's well and fine. But what does this mean for us who are already partakers of this new wine? And this is a keen question. So, Let's take a step back from this little interchange between the headwaiter and the groom. Let's look back at what Jesus actually did during the wedding feast. Perhaps this will enlighten the situation a little bit. Of course, he made water and wine. But there are two details about these water jugs which St. John makes explicit. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this, St. John's Gospel is shockingly interconnected with itself. And whenever he includes details, we should pay close attention. He gives us two details here which are both pretty easy to just skim over, to overlook. First, he tells us that these are jugs for ceremonial washing. This means they were part of the ritual cleansing that Jews were expected to perform in accordance with the Mosaic law for a variety of activities, eating and drinking included. Second, he tells us that there are six jugs. Now, six means something in the numerology that scripture uses throughout the Old Testament and into the New. Six means incomplete. The next number Seven means complete. This is a flag that St. John is waving in our faces, indicating to us that we should be on the lookout for another container of water. Because what is happening at Cana is not the whole picture. It's still incomplete. It's six and not yet seven. Now I propose to you that the seventh cleansing jug comes much later in St. John's Gospel, all the way at the Last Supper. It is the container that Jesus uses to clean the feet of his apostles. And this is where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. The miraculous wine at the wedding feast of Cana is intimately connected with cleansing water. This is, after all, the water it was changed from. And so fittingly, there is a call being made here by the Lord to beseech each and every one of us to do as he does and to serve the needs of his servants. This serves as an appeal to works of mercy for all those who would partake of this new wine. 
That would be simple enough. But Jesus transformed water intended to be poured out for the cleansing of the body into wine that is good to drink, to take into ourselves. So too, then, does this new covenant draw us in with the everlasting call of Jesus Christ. Repent and believe in the gospel. For while the outward ritual purifications of the Jews were good, the inward purification of the soul is so much better. For while your outward self will again and again be soiled and need purification as you go about your daily life until the day of your bodily death, the inward soul belts out its need for enduring justification in that great and infinite light that is the vision of God the Father in heaven. And so perhaps again, it comes as no surprise that we are talking about wine. And wine that St. John so hopefully connects to the Last Supper for us. Because whenever we speak of bread or of wine, the body and blood of Jesus Christ should be carefully considered. And in this case, I believe that this image that I have walked through with you here today finds its completion in the communion of our Lord Jesus Christ in the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist, in particular in his most precious blood. For it is in the reception of the Eucharist that our spiritual need for purification is met, our souls strengthened against the temptations of the world and our sins, those which are not mortal, are washed away. This symbol is deep, but straightforward. We all have this call to serve, and we all have this call to repentance. It is the realization of the unity of these two things that the wine at the wedding feast of Cana and the Eucharist which it symbolizes blossoms forth in all its profound beauty within this short reading. Serve those who you are put in power over. Let not your heart be soiled by the uncleanliness of sin and worldly vice but rather repent and believe in the good news that God was made flesh to take away the sins of the world and bring us back into communion with him. Make this resolution daily and cling close to the cup of new wine poured out for each of you. For in that wine there is savor unlike anything the world can offer. In that wine, there is repentance and salvation. Thank you, Brother Thaddeus. At this time, I would invite one of the parents from the school to speak uh, regarding the school open house on January 30th. Okay, so there's an open house at the school on January 30th. I'm presuming that, <laughs> I'm presuming that all the information is in the bulletin. Please be seated for the um, announcements. Um, the next three announcements have to deal with the Centennial Mass here at St. Dominic's on February 20th. So the Archbishop will be here to celebrate our Centennial Mass on September 20th at 10 a.m. That will be the only uh, Mass celebrated that Sunday. In order to clean up the church and parish grounds to prepare for the Centennial, Uh, We're having a cleanup day on Saturday, January 29th, and we'll definitely need volunteers. And tickets for the luncheon following the Centennial Mass are available for purchase at the parish office. For all, for the tickets, for reservations, for all that information regarding the Centennial, please see the parish office as well, take home a bulletin for all that information. On Saturday, uh, Saturday, January 22nd, the Church of the United States, that's Walk for Life, that's uh, Respect for Life weekend, and the Archdiocese of LA is sponsoring the annual Catholic Walk for Life. Flyers are available in the vestibule in the church for those who are interested. Uh, St. Dominic's will be offering the three-hour initial Beer 2 Safe Environment class 
protecting God's children uh, this coming Saturday, space is, and space is limited, register at the parish office. Our Queen's Care nurse continues to offer COVID booster shots and flu shots every Thursday from 8 a.m. to 12 noon. Um, Brother Thaddeus, uh, if you want to learn more from Brother Thaddeus, he'll be offering his uh, new series on exploring the Eucharist uh, open to young adults uh, between the ages of 18 through 39. Uh, begins on January 27th. January 27th in the evening uh, with confessions available for some of those sessions. Um, of, of course, take home a bulletin for all that information. And finally, tomorrow, of course, is Martin Luther King. And we'll be having one parish mass that day at 9 a.m. That's the only parish mass at 9 a.m. here at the parish. And the, the offices and the facilities and the school is otherwise closed. Please rise now for the final blessing. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you always in the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God.